The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Coming up on the show, the digital revolution has had profound effects on media and democracy. I'll speak with professor and author Robert McChesney about the digital revolution and the current media crisis. But first, a look at media and Latin America. Mexican journalist Fernando del Rincón, who until late September was host for CNN Spanish, will now work for Venezuela's right-wing opposition. Del Rincón was appointed press director of San Cristobal Municipality and advisor to the separatist movements in Tachira, Venezuela. He visited Venezuela earlier this year to cover violent events promoted by the right-wing opposition. He also covered the municipal election in San Cristobal when Mayor Patricia de Caballos was elected. The former CNN journalist has not given a statement about his appointment so far, but he has posted on Twitter that the Venezuelan government will not silence him. CNN released an official statement saying that Del Rincon was leaving as executives there could not reach an agreement on the continuation of his contract. The announcement came just hours after Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro denounced a plot against his government in which he directly accused CNN, El Nuevo Herald and the Colombian channel NTN24 of playing a role. Regardless if you think the internet is utopian bliss or dystopian hell, a handful of monopolies dominate it with profound consequences for media and democracy. Robert McChesney is professor at University of Illinois. He has authored numerous books, including Digital Disconnect, How Capitalism is Turning the Internet Against Democracy. Hi, Robert, and welcome to Imaginary Lines. My pleasure to be here, Chris. You have written that we are in a profound, critical juncture for our communications. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I think everyone knows that <clears throat> with the rise of the internet and digital communication, we're seeing a, a dramatic change, a revolutionary change in communication and with that society. That's sort of a, a self-evident point now. And what I think, <clears throat> having said that, um, you know, wh what the nature of that change is is entirely unclear. How it's going to be controlled, what direction it's going to go. And what I argue is that on its current path, sort of beholden to capital, to wealth, to privilege, the internet will not fulfill much of the democratic potential and in fact will become a regressive anti-democratic force. And that if we wish to have a live in a more just and humane society, it's imperative that we come up with policies to create a digital communication system that encourages those values, doesn't discourage them. One of the myths surrounding the internet and media is that it is synonymous with the market and democracy. How does the market undermine the potential of the internet and media for realizing a free and self-governing society? Well, it does so in a lot of different ways. Uh, but first of all, you know, one of the biggest promises of the internet back in the 19, early 1990s and really throughout the 1990s was that it was going to lead to a new economy. And this new economy was going to be dominated uh, no longer by giant dinosaur, colossal monopolistic corporations, but instead the internet was gonna make it possible for new entrepreneurs, small businesses, consumers, cooperatives, all sorts of alternative institutions to chip away at the monopoly power of the big giant corporations and create a much more democratic, egalitarian, competitive market economy. That was the promise. Uh, <clears throat> so it's somewhat ironic that as we look at the internet in 2014 and we look at its record of the last 15 years, I think it's safe to say that the internet has been the greatest producer of economic monopoly in the history of the human race. Nothing comes close to it. It's Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, they're enormous companies. And what this does is it poses fundamental political problems for any society. When you have that much concentrated private unaccountable economic power, uh, the track record is clear that will pretty much make it almost impossible to have anything close to a credible democracy because those private interests will have so much power, they will dominate on any issue that concerns them. 
What are some of the ways in which the digital revolution is affecting journalism? In the United States, in most places in the world, journalism has been supported, the resources to get it done has been supported by advertising, the vast majority of it, uh, in the 20th century and through to today. And what the internet has done, interestingly enough and more importantly, is it's pretty much eliminated advertising support for journalism. We're rapidly in the moment when advertisers will no longer directly support journalism unless they want to buy content to support their political values. We have in the United States today, for example, maybe approximately one third the number of paid working reporters per capita that we had 25 years ago, and we're losing them every day. It's, it's just a, an ongoing tragedy. And so I say that one of the great challenges for all societies, including the United States, is coming up with policy policies to recreate, reform an independent, credible news media system. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. What role can the digital revolution play in the realization of a democratic and self-governing society? Well, the great tragedy of our times, the single overriding tragedy or contradiction of our times that defines our century. Um, is that we have on one hand these amazing technologies that dramatically increase human productivity, dramatic economic productivity, as the internet and digital communication does, and we're on the verge of a, another wave of technologies that will do that in the next five or 10 years. At the same time, we have an economic system, capitalism, it's set up to maximize profits for the few at the top. And as a result, these great technologies, rather than creating great jobs and wonderful conditions for the great bulk of people, have been turned on their head. Digital technology basically is a job killer for most places. Uh, they're, they're not helping creating new jobs, they're killing old jobs. Uh, the benefits of the internet of the digital revolution are going to a very small fraction of the population of gazillionaires around the world, especially in California and a few other places. And for the rest of us, it's more poverty, it's declining public services. So I think the great challenge for us is how do we get an economic system uh, that puts to use these technologies to benefit all of us? Thank you, Robert, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. My pleasure. And now in other media-related news, St. Louis police departments are holding a workshop on how to control the media narrative. The workshop comes in the wake following Ferguson community protests after police officer Darren Wilson shot and killed unarmed black teenager Michael Brown. The workshop is called Officer Involved Shooting. You can win with the media. The flyer for the workshop explained that, among other topics to be discussed, are Meet the 900 Pound Gorilla, Feeding the Animal, Managing Media Assault and Battery, and Managing the Media When Things Get Ugly, with Think Ferguson in parentheses. Following the police murder of Michael Brown, the St. Louis Police Departments, especially in the Ferguson municipality, came under international criticism when police used violent force against the communities protesting. The protests opened up a national conversation about race and police violence in the U.S. That's it for today's Imaginary Lines. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week.